Welcome to the All of Us Research Program Speaker Series at the Bronx Community Health Network. My name is Paulette Spencer. To learn more about the All of Us Research Program at BCHN, please visit our webpage at www.bchnhealth.org backslash all of us. The following interview is in two parts. This is part one. The Bronx is home to almost 1.5 million people, the majority of whom are people of color. In terms of our survival, the primary cause of death in the Bronx is heart disease, followed by cancer and other ailments. We also have some of this New York City's highest rates of asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. Yet as a community, Bronx residents are underrepresented in clinical studies that address these very same ailments. We are happy to have with us today to discuss Bronx-based community research, Dr. Monique Guichard, PhD. Dr. Guichard is an Associate Professor of Psychology at Bronx Community College, the Chief Executive Officer for the Bronx Community Research Review Board, also known as BX Crip, and Project Lead for the Community Engaged Research Academy. Welcome, Dr. Guichard. My first question is, what is the Bronx Community Research Review Board and what does it do? Thanks so much again for having me and the crib. Um, I don't know why it's saying that. Um, ordinarily, I would do this presentation with a BX crib member, um, but unfortunately no one was available. Um, I love connecting with lots of people, young people, black and brown people. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, I would encourage the attendees to please interrupt us to ask questions. Um, if I sound jargony, I'm not a person that likes to rely on jargon, even though I have lots of degrees after my name, but tell me to slow down, ask me what that word meant, and I'll go back and make sure that I unpack it. You're not going to um, hurt my feelings or bother me by doing any of those things. So um, really quickly, like Paulette said, I'm an associate professor of psychology at Bronx Community College, which is my alma mater. Um, I'm a 36-year Bronx resident. Um, I love my borough. Uh, just because I got educated um, didn't mean that I was going to leave um, it um, and live someplace else. Um, I think that it's important uh, for future Bronx scholars or whatever to come back home um, and to do something to unsettle what me and the members of the Bronx Community Research Review Board call research predation. Um, really quickly, research predation is just our understanding of the reality that millions of dollars, dare I say, almost a billion dollars is invested in Bronx-based research. Yet we, for the ninth year, ninth, right, Paulette? For the ninth year in a row, we, uh, we rank 62 um, out of uh, 62 uh, counties uh, through the Robert Wood Johnson um, ranking of uh, health outcomes uh, for New York State uh, counties, right? Um, so what does it mean that research is being conducted every single day in our borough, yet in terms of so many um, health factors and outcomes, we're just not moving? Okay, so the Bronx Community Research Review Board is a volunteer board of Bronx residents, Bronx patients, Bronx caregivers, um, we are multi-ethnic, we are multi-generational, we are queer and not queer. Um, we represent a variety of health conditions. Um, so for example, I'm dealing with delayed fertility, but also systemic allergies and some respiratory ailments. Um, we don't purport to represent necessarily our communities, but we know a thing or two about what it means to be a Bronx patient with particular conditions or a caregiver, like I care for my mom who's elderly and has diabetes and had a stroke. So we know a thing or two of what it means to encounter Bronx-based institutions um, when we're trying to get justice, health, be well, all, all of those things. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the BX Crib has grown since Paulette moved on to BCHN, um, but I think it was impacted by a lot of her early work and nurturing it. Um, we, as of 
the late 2019 are an independent 501c3 organization. Um, our basic mission is to rigorously and lovingly um, advocate for Bronx residents um, by engaging researchers, by engaging policymakers, um, by engaging our neighbors and making sure that whatever research is conducted, we are not anti-research, we just want good research, right? <laughs> I want to be clear about that. We are not anti-research, even though sometimes a question that we ask when, when um, researchers email us and ask to work with us, uh, we do ask the question, is new research the intervention that's needed? right? Or could you do secondary analysis? Um, that just means looking at prior research and re-examining it for, for particular populations of people or with a particular, a, a different focus, right? So one question that we, ought to, we definitely ask a lot is, is new research the intervention that's needed? And we ask that question going back to thinking about research predation because oftentimes we are asked to be participants as Bronx residents in studies, and then we never get the results back, right? Um, and I'm saying this as a researcher, right? Um, I think a lot of my colleagues think that when they publish in a journal or put their findings on a website, like that's it. Like they returned your findings to you. Um, but we also um, are the carriers of, of lots of stories of Bronx patients and caregivers telling us that like, you know, my son or my mama was in a study and I don't know what happened, right? I don't know if we were in the control group. I don't know if we were in the experimental group, but I don't even know what was done with our data, right? Um, so we try to assure that research is conducted in a way that's culturally responsive. It's what the people want, um, that it's culturally appropriate, that it's fair, that it's ethical, that it's impacting our health as immediately as it can, and that research is being used as a tool to achieve social and environmental justice. Is that, is that good enough? It's great. Um, I bet you everybody wish they was from the Bronx at this moment, because we rep our, our borough really, really hard. In a nutshell, um, the BX crib is this um, baby Cardi B who just looks out for exploitative researchers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a little bit. Okay. Okay, let me switch this to gallery view. Um, so my, my question is, since we are in a borough where I, I find not, not many people really understand what clinical research is, and we, we sort of throw around terms, you know, there's, there's, medical, there's medical research, there's clinical research, there's basic research. So I want to really get to the bottom of what clinical research is and what are its main two components? Okay, so I'm gonna confess that I am a community social psychologist. I, I don't, I wouldn't ever call myself a clinical researcher. I do what's called social and behavioral research. Um, and, and we can talk about what that is in a second. My understanding of clinical research, is it's, it's a form of medical research and the data can be participants' experiences it can be your health records, right? It could be your statistics. It could be your tissue samples. It could be a biospecimen, right? Um, and so uh, that research uses those varieties of data to try to understand something about health and disease, right? It tries to explore new treatment options, new drugs, um, new interventions. Yeah, that's basically my understanding of clinical research. Okay. And mm -hmm. why is it important that our communities are represented in clinical, in, in research in general, actually? Yeah, so this is where it gets really tricky for me, Paulette, where I always say that I, I define myself as a, a kind of reluctant researcher, but someone who is always intentional about ethics. And I'll say, like, we have to acknowledge that in this country, research has a racist, ableist, sexist history, um, and Black people, Black women, uh, non-neurotypical um, folks, like so many people at the margins of different communities have been exploited and taken advantage of um, for the benefit of other populations of people, usually upper middle class white folks, right? Um, so, 
part of my answer to why it's important for us to be involved in research, right? If we are being treated with the understanding that we're being treated respectfully, ethically, that we know what we're getting into, we have been informed about what the risks and the benefits of the study are, is that um, we are not, when you're thinking about treatment options, when you're thinking about interventions or whatever, you need to know how those things play out in different populations of people, right? Um, and as a feminist social psychologist, I'll tell you that even when it comes to women, right, most drugs, what we understand about them, like how we metabolize them, how they impact us or whatever, are based on upper white men, upper middle class white men as a sample of participants. That's not us, right? <laughs> Um, so it's important for us to be involved in these studies so that we understand the diversity of outcomes of different experiences of these drugs, interventions, treatments, or whatever. We can't ever um, be adequately treated unless we are included as participants first. Absolutely. Um I'm going to just turn briefly to the relationship between medical establishment and the community. Mm -hmm. and to, to what extent is the quality of the pre-existing relationship between the medical establishment and our community critical to our community's participation in research? Um, it is absolutely critical. Um, I've been studying research ethics for a very, very, very long time. And that's just you know, a field of philosophy, but also science and psychology that studies how physicians, doctors, researchers ought to treat the people that we call participants, right? How ought we need to treat them as human beings, but also treat their blood, their tissues, their samples or whatever. How do we regard them? Um, a lot of people like to point to the 1932, 1972 um, public health service Tuskegee syphilis study and say that that study was like the thing that broke the relationship between um, American medicine, I guess, um, and black peoples. But actually that's not true, right? When you engage the history um, more intimately, you know about Miss Henrietta Lacks, right? You know about the Ralph sisters. You know that since enslavement and colonization, there's a, an uncomfortable relationship between research, enslavement, colonization, imperialism, right? Um, we know that name a science, and it was largely built on the exploitation of black and brown bodies, right? So there would be no virology if it wouldn't, there wasn't for Henrietta Lacks, right? There wouldn't be any gynecology if J. Marion Sims didn't um, do horrible experiments with Betsy, Anurka, and other enslaved women, right? So knowing that history, <laughs> the relationship is not good, right? And a lot of people also like to say, well, this was, a, this was stuff in the past, right? But we, we jumped to the 1990s, we jumped to 2000, we know about stuff like Arizona State studies with the Havasupai Nation, or about the Kennedy Krieger lead paint studies in Baltimore, right? So we, we also have more recent examples of where researchers tell us this is the thing that's happening, but they don't necessarily regard us. They think that we are individuals, right? And let's be real, Paulette, if your mama in a research study, you in a research study too, right? Established medicine may see us as individual participants, but we are in communities, like you say, we have social identities, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can't, if someone in my family is encouraged or recruited to be in a research study, I feel like I'm in that study too, because they're calling me, what does this word mean? <laughs> Right. Um, so it's a rocky relationship at a time where we urgently need to attend to health inequities and health disparities around how COVID-19 um, is disproportionately impacting our communities. Right. Um, yeah. I'm not, go ahead, Poet. Yeah, I, 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 I'm 
thinking to myself about one, what the informed consent process is and, and given everything that we, you've spoken about, um, Henrietta Lacks, um, also the experimentation that was done on people to develop the pill. Mm -hmm. um, what, one, what were some of the, um, some of the structures that were put in place after all of that happened to try sure. to, um, to avoid all of that from happening again or to have certain protections uh, from an ethical point of view? And what is the importance of informed consent as a process? Okay, so um, informed consent came after, after to be as a direct result of the public health Tuskegee syphilis study, 1932 to 1972, right? Um, and that study, uh, not in and of itself, because the researchers were publishing on it and nobody thought denying black men and their wives and their girlfriends and their children to be treatment was really a big thing, right? No, no one thought that having a control study in the medical community um, where people were being denied treatment when penicillin became available was a big thing, but it was when journalists got involved and started calling this American apartheid um, that the federal government established what's called the Belmont Commission. Um, and that was a, a fancy way of saying um, it, got, it called together leading physicians and ethicists and researchers together. Um, and if there's one thing that I say, please remember Miss Dorothy Height. Miss Dorothy Height was a black woman who at the time was on the National Council of Negro Women, um, who was there knowing a thing or two about um, incarcerated black folks and research but also about the Ralph sisters and what happened to them and the forced sterilization of black women and girls. Um, and out of that commission came kind of the agreed upon American standard of ethical regulations um, that we call the common rule. Or, or, um, and in the common rule, it's very complicated. I can talk about, I could do another dissertation on this, but part of the common rule says that what was unethical about the Tuskegee study is no one had ever said to those men or their girlfriends or their wives or their children who are all unintended participants, you are in a research study. These are the risks of your participation in the research study. This is when the research study began. This is when the research study will conclude. This is your remuneration or your compensation for, getting, for being involved in this study. Um, you can stop being involved in this study anytime you choose without anything bad happening to you, right? You can decline to participate. Um, here are some benefits, maybe not to you, but to mankind and society as a result of your participation. So what informed consent did, so the, the Belmont Commission established ethical rules. Um, there are three that are really important to us, non-malfeasance, justice, beneficence, right? But, but basically those things say that a huge part of demonstrating ethical conduct in research, if you're gonna get money from the federal government, right, to do your work, is that you have to show that all participants, whether they're people with diminished capacity, um, so children can ascend to research, so people who have met, um, intellectual disabilities, can also ascend to research, but someone else has to consent for them, right? It tells them the risks and benefits of their participation, their, their right to withdraw, and it does so in a language that is accessible to that person. And that matters to the Bronx, because informed consent in our borough means your consent form better be in Spanish, it better be in Tejano Spanish, it better be in Spanish that Puerto Ricanos and Dominicanos can understand. It might have to be in Bengali, right? Or you may have to record yourself saying that for, for people who have other um, issues with, with accessing it. So I hope I under explained both some of the ethical um, frameworks that were established. Um, another thing that came out of the Belmont Commission and the Common Rule was the establishment of what's called an Institutional Research Review Board. Right. So out of the common rule, and it's, it's called an IRB, you've probably heard that before. Right. So an IRB um, 
this law basically says if you're an institution that is again getting money from the federal government to do research you have to establish this body this group of different scientists and researchers from different fields that will ethically evaluate the studies that people want to do right they'll evaluate them for risks for benefits for the informed consent procedures for how you are going to safeguard people's data right safeguarding our data in the in the digital realm where our government is being hacked is a big, is a big thing right so how are you going to store data how are you going to um, respect privacy and confidentiality the IRB decides all of these things and IRBs are by law by these these same laws that we're talking about usually these scientists but there's a provision in the law that says that one person on the irb has to be a member of community right now we know community can mean a lot of things right but they have to be unrelated and unaffiliated with the academic institution so we think about the bronx right that means bronx community college ostos lehman montefiore almost each hospital <laughs> The Bronx Lebanon, Bronx Care, that's what it's called now, right? All of these institutions have institutional re research review boards. And some members of the BX Crib are on those boards. Um, and we think that IRBs are, they can be effective. Um, but we think that IRBs look at standard American individualistic ethics. And we at the BX Crib care more about like our community as a unit of analysis, right? So what happens when you do a study about the people on Burnside Avenue and your study reveals Burnside is dangerous and you're more likely to get an STI living there or whatever. Well, now you're saying something not about individual people. You're saying something about a group um, that can be psychologically harmful, right? So the, the way that we enter into the conversations is we think about individual research risks and benefits, but also about the group risk and benefits. And by when we say group or community, we just don't mean black, brown, Latinx, African, or whatever folks. We mean people at the intersection of those groups. We mean different gendered groups. We mean different disease communities. We mean a very, complex groupings of people. Wow. 